All right, Chuck, we're, been, we're here at the site of the Battle of the Sand Creek, you know, the Sand Creek Massacre. That's the Battle of Sand Creek, or however you want to refer to it. How big a battle was it? How many Indians were involved? How many soldiers? What? How big was this deal? Well, there's that's one area of this that there's a lot of agreement on. There's very little agreement on anything else, but that's pretty well agreed upon. And that is that there's about 120 teepees here. And by just figuring so many to a teepee, they figured there had to be 500 Indians here by right. four point so many per teepee is how they figured it. So 500 Indians, but it's real spread out, two or three miles, little groups here and there along the creek. And then the soldiers, uh, about 500 of the Colorado 3rd and 200 of the Colorado 1st. And they also was a group of uh, Mexicans here too. So 700. More or less, you know, right. More. Right now, the Mexicans were they—they they were part of the fighting force too, then, or? I think for the most part, they were herded the horses, the, the Indian horses, away from the oh, area. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. I think it was mostly what they did. Okay. Yeah. All right. Now this—this this would have made. A, so this is a teepee site, basically. Yeah, right here. That you've right already here. marked. You've been here, bringing stuff. Yeah, yeah, sure. This is where the fire was right here. Their fire pit in the center of their teepee. So. And then the TP opened. In the wintertime, they opened to the southeast because that's where the sun would rise. Right. Kind of this direction. Now, see, this is what's interesting to me because a lot of times on television, you see these guys and they'll have their camp right next to the water. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, no way. The mosquitoes and the cold, you know, if it's, it's the wintertime, it's going to be too cold right next to water. And sometimes the mosquitoes and stuff, they're going to be out with and catch a breeze. Just Yeah, right. And then there's a little ways from the water here. Yeah, but it's not that, you know, it's, it's far enough to get away from the mosquitoes and that kind of thing. But, you know, that, that's the thing. Uh, just imagine, that, that's the thing, the, the, the history part of this country of ours just amazes me because there's just so much history. And it just seems like, uh, well, like this, you know, you don't exactly have a, uh, a national park with tour buses and all those kind of things. I know you folks, you folks do tours and, and bring people out, and I think it's a wonderful thing, you know. Mm -hmm. But there's a lot of this history that people just don't know about. It is really why we know that we found the Sand Creek site because of the 12-pounder mountain howitzer shell fragments. And these were again found in this area. Um, these were all from one shell. All these pieces do fit together. And it was, um, this end was threaded and this, uh, it's called a Borman fuse. This fuse threaded into the end of the howitzer shell. And then it was had numbers from one to five. And uh, they would poke a hole in there, depending on how long they wanted that to wait before it exploded after it leaving the cannon. This one had the hole pushed at five seconds, so at, at number five. So it took it five seconds for the powder inside of there to burn from here all the way around to here. Uh, to then there was a hole on the other side which would ignite the black powder then in the, the shell, and then it would explode at that point. And then it had these uh, 69 caliber lead balls inside. And one reason you know that these are from the cannon and not from a, a musket is that they have these, they're dimpled all the way around. You can see little dimpled marks, which was caused from them just being uh, together like that, or probably the two from when it exploded and it, they hit each other a little bit and dimpled them. The uh, cavalry, they took uh, four 12-pounder mountain howitzers to Sand Creek. We don't know for sure exactly if they were all used or not, but they, according to the reports, they did take four there. And these uh, howitzer uh, cannons, they had three different types of projectiles that they could use, and they did have all three of these uh, out there. We have found proof of that. Uh, the first was what was called a canister, which is basically like a tin can filled with uh, 69 caliber lead balls, gunpowder, then a wooden sabot and a gunpowder bag basically like a big shotgun shell when it would be fired. Then the next one was called a spherical case shot, which was a hollow, round, cast iron ball, about, these were a little less than five inch diameter, uh, filled with the lead balls, gunpowder, again with the wooden sabot and the uh, gunpowder bag. And, uh, and so when this fired, it had been, uh, had a, what was called a Borman fuse that was in the end which would allow it to, the cast iron ball then to explode anywhere from one to five seconds after leaving the cannon. And how they did this, they poked a hole in this fuse. Um, it was numbered one to five, and if they poked the hole at five, that meant that five seconds after leaving the cannon, the cannon ball would explode. And the ones we found, there was one that was set at number five and two that were set at number two. And the Indians call this the gun that fires twice because of the 
the boom it would make on the initial firing and then when the cast iron ball exploded, it would uh, expl make an exploding sound again. And the third was just called a shell, basically the same thing with the exception it did not have the lead balls inside. The cast iron was a little thicker and it would be just the cast iron shrapnel uh, that would do the damage. Um, then how these were done, when they loaded the shell into the cannon barrel, uh, one of the gunners, he, his job was to poke a hole through the hole that was in the end of the cannon barrel that would uh, pierce the uh, gunpowder bag. And then through that, then they would uh, put the friction primer uh, into that hole. And basically it was just a little round copper tube with a wire, uh, twisted wire piece with a loop on the end that went horizontally through it. And it hook the lanyard into this loop and then give it a quick uh, yank and which would create, be just almost like striking a match. A little spark then would uh, shoot into the cannon bar barrel and that would be what would fire the cannon.